Thanks for tuning in to Beats Research Radio, a YouTube and podcast stream from an active lab at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. Our goal at Beats Research Radio is to communicate research and science to the community. I'm Hallie, and today I'll be your uh, host on today's episode with Dr. Jane Friedman. Our, our guest today, Dr. Jane Friedman, is a professor in cardiovascular medicine at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and the Director of Translational Research for the UMass Memorial Heart and Vascular Center, where she is an attending physician. Dr. Friedman is also the Editor-in-Chief of Circulation, Circulation Research Journal and a highly respected investigator and clinician in the field of cardiovascular medicine. Uh, her research is focused on inflammation and immunity in cardiovascular thrombosis, as well as the biomarkers and modulators of heart disease and stroke. So thank you very much for joining us here on Beats Research Radio. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'd like to start our discussion today with um, by asking you a little bit about uh, your research and the main themes that your lab is interested in. So um, research develops over many years, mm -hmm. but uh, Themes that we have um, had that have been continuous through many decades now of research has been the role of inflammation um, in regulating the outcomes and occurrence of cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease. Okay. So what specific, um, maybe some specific projects that you guys are looking into currently and maybe uh, the difference in between what you may, might have studied a couple of years ago? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, Earlier, a lot of what we were doing had um, more to do with interactions with the actual vessel wall. Okay. Um, now we're looking at uh, the interactions of cells within the vessel wall in addition to the vessel wall. So some of the projects we are looking at have to do with the role of the platelet beyond causing clotting or thrombosis mm -hmm. and its interaction with white cells and how that regulates both diseases of the vessel wall as well as immunity and infection. Okay, so have you always been interested in the platelets specifically, or? Uh, yeah, I've been doing platelet research since uh, even before I went to medical school. Okay. So yes, it's been the one, as many other areas of research have changed within my lab, it's been one of the constants. The constants, okay. Yeah. Um, so how is this uh, research translational, and how does it go from the lab bench um, mm -hmm. in your lab to being at the patient bedside? Right. That's a great question. So uh, we actually asked that question um, at one point about 20 years ago now. Mm -hmm. We wanted to know if a lot of the things we had been um, looking at at the bench in platelets and white cells um, and uh, endothelial cells were relevant uh, to uh, patient outcomes um, and patient disease. And mm -hmm. we did um, very early in sort of the omics um, field, we did a broad transcriptomic screening of platelets from people who were having heart attacks versus not having heart attacks. And what we discovered was there were huge differences in expression, mostly in genes we had never thought to study before. And you mentioned uh, platelets are involved in infection. Can mm -hmm. you expand a little bit more on that? Sure, sure. So... Uh, we um, started out by initially showing that platelets uh, played a role in bacterial infection, but a very interesting study that Milka Kupanova and the lab just completed and we published six months ago was actually looking at the role of platelets in flu infection. Okay. So using people who had had the flu last year at the University of Massachusetts, we were able to show that platelets actually take up the flu virus and present it to the white cells. So it appears they're the first line of defense in, flight, in fighting flu infection. So we actually have pictures of them actively taking up flu, oh, sticking wow. to the white cells and turning on the white cells. And one of the reasons this is very interesting um, to us, uh, because we do cardiovascular research, mm -hmm. is the observation that's been in the New England Journal and other um, and many other high-impact journals showing that people who have flu infections are at risk for heart attacks the first week. Um, after their flu infection. Oh, wow. It's one of the most common ways people die from the flu okay. is actually heart attacks or other thrombotic effects. And we believe that some of this may be mediated by the direct effect of flu on the labor. Oh, wow. That's great. I didn't know that. That yeah. was a different course. Do you think that, uh, or has this information, this new information, um, being used to uh, treat the flu or possibly be used for the vaccine for the flu? Mm -hmm. Well, 
it doesn't really change the recommendations of who should undergo That's a true. flu vaccine. It's sort of everybody right now, mm -hmm. and certainly you should if you're at risk of cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. But it does raise the possibility that for some people, um, things that might be antiplatelet agents might be useful if they're at high risk when presenting with the flu, you know, moderating that with the risk of right. bleeding and someone who might not need it. Oh, wow, so, yeah. that's very interesting. So mm -hmm. this information is being used in the clinic right now, or well, we just it... published it about five months ago. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't think it's quite it you know its quite way. made its way all the way back. Okay. And it would really take another study to show that intervening mm -hmm. um, in flu infection patients who are at risk for heart attacks would be right. useful um, proactively. Okay, so um, when this information can be used in the clinic, how how would it be integrated into right. into maybe the practice of a, of a physician. Right. Well, it could be that someone who has certain risk factors but maybe not overt co cardiovascular disease would benefit from something that would be preventative of you know, heart disease, whether it's aspirin or some other drug that's currently used for prevention. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Uh -huh. So um, we just we asked about the, the successes, but have there been any persisting limitations in your realm of research mm -hmm. with cardiovascular thrombosis? Mm -hmm. Well, in the field of thrombosis, the biggest limitation for us and for pretty much everybody else is uh, with thrombosis and hemostasis, it's really a very delicate balance. Mm -hmm. So as you um, turn off or quiet the platelet, you raise the risk of bleeding. So right. anything that affects the platelet from that perspective could have uh, negative repercussions in a patient in mm -hmm. terms of bleeding. And so that balance has been very difficult, uh, I think, at the patient level. Mm -hmm. um, as more and more drugs have been discovered and mechanisms of inhibiting the platelet have been advanced, it's led to uh, bleeding problems. Right. Very, very interesting. So um, you also, aside from the basic research that you mm -hmm. do with platelets and thrombosis, um, you're also the director of the High Throughput Gene mm -hmm. Expression and Biomarker Corps mm -hmm. at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Could you tell us a little bit about that facility and what maybe the main goals of that facility are? Sure. So that facility was started because of our interest in more broadly screening circulating mm -hmm. cells, platelets, white cells, red cells. Um, and we set up uh, a platform so even in low abundant RNA tissues or cells, we could broadly screen them. Okay. So we have sequencing and high throughput PCR platforms and some proteomics platforms um, in the laboratory. And we really use it broadly. We've coupled with many of the large population studies uh, in the U.S. and throughout the world to look at broad screens of RNA um, from cell-free and cell-based populations. Um, as well as working with uh, clinical trials and, and other groups. Okay. So, you know, we, we work beyond cardiovascular disease. We've collaborated with people in infectious diseases or oncology. But most of it is revolving about different um, aspects of clinical cardi cardiovascular okay. disease and adding to sort of the whole omics based overlay um, right. to better define disease. Right. So the the samples that you would uh, look at in mm -hmm. that in that um, facility, would they be all coming from patients or would they be coming from elsewhere? Mm -hmm. So m most of what we do is from patients. We do we have been doing screens from mouse models, okay. people. So we have done mirroring screens. Um, but most of them come from uh, recently or previously co collected mm -hmm. um Clinical population, clinical some population. thousand, okay. you know, some over ten thousand people, mm -hmm. some dozen. You know, it sort of depends right. on what the question is that people mm -hmm. are asking. So, the patients who are who are giving their information, or giving their samples, would they get that information back from you, or right. are they involved in that process at all? No, no. typically they're mm -hmm. not. It's not like genomic screening, okay. really. So, um, typically they're they're not given right. their data back. It'd no. be like a, a donation almost. Yeah, like, yeah. Part usually, of study. Right. They're usually have agreed to be part of a study or mm -hmm. part of a population project or okay. part of a repository. Many mm -hmm. people when they come to the hospital now give um, you know an aliquot of blood to be part of um, a donor pool okay. based in that hospital. Oh. So um, the because you're working with patients and with this facility, does it um, improve the translational ability of basic science? Does, mm -hmm. Is it used um, because less for the diagnostics or yeah. more for kind of understanding the basic science side of things right. and meshing them? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So 
you know, the actual generation of these data sets um, comes from many different sources, mm -hmm. and typically it is more of a clinical question because uh, some of these screens are very big and they can be costly. Right. Um, but once they're done, it's very uh, rewarding when they get used by basic scientists. So someone says, well, I know from a publication that you did a big screen of something in this population of 1,000 people. Did you find this one gene I'm interested in? And is it related to hypertension? Because I care about, you know, mm -hmm. vascular tone or something like that. And it's always very rewarding to be able to use the data to help people in that case. Okay, well, that's, yeah. that's great. So the information is shared when it comes out of the, the facility? So it depends on the source of it. So okay. some things are more open access and some things are more closed access. Mm -hmm. So it depends on... Did we generate it? One of our collaborators generated it. Right. Is it publicly available in something like DBCAP, mm -hmm. some public repository? Is it not? Right. Are there conditions set on it? So a lot of it depends on how the original study was mm -hmm. crafted. Okay. Well, we're actually going to be getting to that in our next segment uh, here with Dr. Jane Friedman. We'll be talking a little bit more about open access and social media with regards to science. So we'll just take a short break now, and we'll be back in a few minutes. What are the non-modifiable risk factors for cardiovascular disease? Cardiovascular disease can be caused by a variety of risk factors we cannot control. The older you are, the more prone you are to chronic conditions like heart disease or stroke. However, men have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease earlier in life, while women are more at risk after menopause. Women may also experience different symptoms of heart attack that may go unrecognized. You may be more at risk depending on your ethnicity, People of Asian, African, or First Nation descent have higher rates of cardiovascular disease. Your ethnicity may also influence your diet, which can put you at an increased risk for cardiovascular disease. 
If you have a first degree relative who has had cardiovascular disease or a stroke before the age of 55 for men and 65 for women, your risk of heart disease doubles and regular screenings with your doctor are recommended. But there is good news. Up to 80% of premature cardiovascular disease can be avoided and more effectively managed by taking these proactive steps. Quit smoking, be physically active, eat well, achieve a healthy weight, manage your stress and any anxiety or depression, and see your doctor about managing your cholesterol, blood pressure, and blood sugar levels. For more information on cardiovascular disease, please visit our website. EATS Radio, scientists interviewing scientists. Canada is a worldwide leader in science and innovation. However, our communities need to be more connected to current scientific research in order to drive the future of scientific innovation. So what steps can we take to more actively engage and connect our community with scientists and vice versa? Innovation and discovery are at the core of the current efforts of our government, but science sometimes gets slightly complicated to understand. At Beats Radio, we will tackle this by having young scientists and early career researchers interviewing scientists and innovators. By dissecting science in simple terms, this will allow our community to better understand the importance of science for our country. Hello and welcome back to Beats Research Radio. My name is Hallie and I'll be your host on today's episode. If you missed our first segment, uh, sitting with us today on Beats Research Radio is Dr. Jane Friedman. Dr. Friedman is a professor in cardiovascular medicine at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and the director of the translational research for the UMass Memorial Heart and Vascular Center. And Dr. Friedman is also the uh, Editor-in-Chief of Circulation Research Journal, which we're going to talk a little bit more about in this segment. So thank you for, for joining us for the second segment. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Great. Um, so you've recently been appointed, or at, in 2019, um, as the Editor-in-Chief of Circulation Research. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the journal and maybe how you would go about putting together an issue? Oh, okay, sure. So the journal is... Uh, you know, a very exciting journal that deals with uh, topics in cardiovascular research, um, ranging from primarily basic research and translational research to uh, clinical research if it's got a mechanistic side to it. Okay. So we do span the whole spectrum with a focus more on basic, uh, basic cardiovascular research from a broad area of topics. Mm -hmm. um, and the way we basically put together an issue is we... Um, have wonderful science submitted to us uh, that we all really genuinely enjoy reading. And when the science comes in, it gets um, distributed to uh, associate and deputy editors who are experts in the specific fields. Okay. And they send it out to reviewers. Um, and then if it's uh, thought to be appropriate for the journal, it undergoes the revision process with the authors. And after that, uh, when it's ready, it hits the pages. Right. Very, very Big, big journal. Yeah. So, um, what direction do you, do you want to see the journal go in um, for your uh, as your editor in chief for the next maybe months or even years? Mm -hmm. So, you know, first of all, we want to continue the really wonderful work that was done mm -hmm. by the group before us in having um, very strong, interesting cardiovascular science that's highly impactful mm -hmm. um, and important to our community. Um, 
uh, going forward, we hope to broaden perhaps this type of science that's mm -hmm. in it. So more types of uh, original science from a broader type of um, scientific interest, obviously all still within cardiovascular science, but yeah. touching on other topics as well. Okay. So we're trying to broaden it a little bit. Um, and we're devoting more pages of the journal to original science, so more to just more research and a little bit less um, to other types of um, solicited content. So okay. uh, more original science. You have a fixed number of pages. Right. So more, more yeah. heavy on the original science and a little bit lighter on other types of content. Okay, I see. Um, so... You publish in both um, the open access way, but mm -hmm. then also the traditional uh, way. And is this chosen by yourself, or is it chosen by the uh, whoever is the author of the right. article that is being um, submitted? Right. So um, for so the American Heart Association has twelve mm -hmm. journals. For one of the journals, JAHA, mm -hmm. it's all open access. So everyone's right. open access. For us and the other journals, it's uh, as you said, it's a hybrid. Okay. And it's the authors that choose. So okay. if the authors want um, to choose to have it immediately open access, they can. Mm -hmm. If they want to have the embargo period, um, then they can choose that as well. So it, it can be mm -hmm. um, either type of copy. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And because open access is becoming a little bit more popular, I would, mm -hmm. I, I would say, um, just in, in order to get uh, research out into mm -hmm. the public and be freely accessed, would you say that more uh, researchers are choosing that option now than before? You know, that's a good question. Since we started working on I don't have those numbers, numbers so I yeah. don't actually know what the trend is specifically mm -hmm. for our journal. But, you know, I know uh, there's it's a very big topic of conversation mm -hmm. because a number of the funders, particularly outside of the United States, are starting to make it a requirement right. of accepting the funding. So right. those, so exactly um, how it gets tied together mm -hmm. because publishing isn't free to right. do it um so it's how it gets reimbursed and yes you know how it becomes open access is a question that's um very timely and clearly undergoing quite a bit of right. change right so the open access is is a great way to you know, be able to share the research mm -hmm. and publications of with the public and the community who wouldn't maybe normally have access to journals like that if you're not a part of a university right. or something or if you're not going to pay for that journal. But um, are there other ways that um, maybe the journals are trying to share this information mm -hmm. besides being open access with the public? Right. So one of the things that's uh, we've been working on a lot since taking over the journal mm -hmm. is increasing our social media profile. Right. So uh, we um, are... We engage with a fair number of people already through Facebook. Um, we had a, the most active, I think, Twitter account of the HA Journal, oh. so that was really wonderful. Um, and so we uh, put out a lot of information through Twitter, and we've started an Instagram account, and we also do monthly podcasts right. about um, content in the journal. Okay, It both interviews people who've been publishing in the journal mm -hmm. We'd like to highlight early career investigators, mm -hmm. and it also does a review point. of some of the, um, the, the sort of timely, high-impact articles. Right. The so the engagement that you get with the, the community, is it uh, more researchers, or is it also just members of the public who are interested mm -hmm. in circulation um, journal? Sure. So it goes both ways, although since some of our research is very basic, it mm -hmm. tends some of those... Um, papers tend to be of less interest to the general public, right. but part of um, what we try to do is make make it so that uh, everyone can understand it, so it's more accessible. Yes. So we do publish summaries um, to try to make it more accessible, mm -hmm. um, and and that's a good way of reaching out to a broader number of people. Occasionally, one of the articles is of uh, broader um, broader media interest. For instance, our we happen to publish on February fourteenth and coincidentally had an article about uh, uh, chocolate flavonoid supplements and walking distance in people who have uh, vascular disease in their okay. legs. And so that, because I think of the time, right. Right. <laughs> that received quite a bit of Definitely. interesting and press about that. Right. So these social media accounts, they're, I guess, becoming more used for research and getting the information out to the public and researchers. Who is responsible for, you know, 
posting all, all right. of this stuff because right. when when research goes through the journals, it's it's been through many review processes mm -hmm. and it's very vetted. But social media, you one click and it's there. So right. who who looks at that? Right. That that's a great question. I have two really wonderful um, social media editors okay. who uh, help a huge amount. Um, with this, uh, one primarily does the podcast, and the other one primarily deals with other areas. But we have really wonderful staff um, in Baltimore who are our managing editor staff, and they um, help put together tweets. Um, we work with authors to find good images mm -hmm. for both the cover and for Instagram and for Facebook. And usually, a lot of the information will start with the staff in Baltimore with the assistance of the two um, social media editors mm -hmm. and they work together, but it's, uh, they're not, um, the only time they're typically live tweeting is from meetings, like BCVS in right. the summer or ATBB or the AJ meeting in the fall, then they'll live tweet, but typically it's more, it's a more vetted process than that. So no one's going okay. off the rails. <laughs> yes, definitely. So, I mean, for, for at least for your um, social media accounts, it's, you have social media editors who are responsible for that and um, their experience with that. But there are a lot of things that get shared on social media that are maybe have been inflated or and just marketed a certain way in order to kind of bring the public in. Mm -hmm. um, do Is there a way that um, maybe going forward um, there can be a way so that people can know if something's been inflated or not? Right. Well, I guess, I mean, uh Typically with Instagram, no, it's an image-driven thing, so yes. it's not a problem. Twitter, it tends to be a long conversation, so mm -hmm. it's it's a little bit of a buyer beware. But then sort of the strength and the negative part about using viewing science on Twitter is mm -hmm. the nice part is it's a conversation, and right. people seem very open about weighing in on, on terms of quality. Yeah. <laughs> um, the downside is, is you can put up whatever you want, so it's mm -hmm. like most other things. Um, right. So how do these new avenues, uh, such as social media and mm -hmm. podcasts, like the one we're on today, um, enhance information and just getting uh, knowledge out to the public right. for all people, for researchers, for right. the public? Right. Well, what I like about them is their transparency. Mm -hmm. It's another way of, um, of making yourself accessible to people who might not normally, would find it daunting to open up the pages of the journal or go to the website and right. find the journal. Um, sort of uh, to their liking. And it's really a way of reaching out to people who like to get their content or learn in different ways. Some people are visual and they'll see an image and be, well, that's really interesting. I'd like to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. um, they like the conversation in Twitter or they like the, you know, they like what they see in the postings on Facebook. So it gives different types of people and not just the basic scientists a chance to find the information accessible and hear what people think about. Right. So, um, are the social media posts more about the publications that you've just published mm -hmm. in the journal or um, or is it more of on the event side of things? Right. So most of it is about articles that are coming out okay. and, you know, short explanations um, in very general terms. So mm -hmm. people understand what it's, you know, it's not typically the signaling pathway right. of <laughs> what it means um, yes. to see to get people interested in it. Um, so typically the journal puts out um, more of that kind of content. When they live tweet for meetings, it's more about, you know, so-and-so uh, mm -hmm. spoke about this really interesting um, project at, you know, at this particular symposium. It's more of that kind of, right. more of that kind of thing and as it relates to the journal. So it's, it's really mixed, but typically we put up the content and the conversation happens after it. We're not there right. to sway people one way or the other. Mm -hmm. We, of course, if we're publishing it, we think it's really interesting. Right. <laughs> so we don't, have, we don't exactly to push it. Yeah. You know. So the questions that you get and the conversations you're talking about, are those um, maybe more basic questions coming mm -hmm. from people who are just interested? Yeah. Or is the conversation more uh, researcher, researcher sort of scenario? Right. Well, it can go sort of various mm -hmm. different ways. Um, if we've done our job and made it available, you know, made it accessible to a broader audience, there's often a broader conversation mm. like this could potentially have impact on, you right. know, this disease or for this kind of person, or I, you know, I can't wait to see what the next step would be. But sometimes it's a conversation among scientists, mm -hmm. um, like you might get in terms of 
someone who writes a letter to the editor. Um, I'm not sure I understand what figure two is really trying to say, or I need clarifications of these methods, or mm -hmm. we've done the same experiment and it came out same, different. You know, right. you get you sort of get everything based on right. Um, very, yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So is there one platform that you would say has been more successful than the others in terms of it? Maybe the images yeah. are, are, are better on Instagram and yeah. Facebook rather than yeah. uh, the other ones? Well, I enjoy the images, so mm -hmm. I, I, I really like the Instagram account. But Cirque Research has had already a, a you know long for, long for social media history of um, uh, you know, being on Twitter. And so mm. that is probably the most engaged um, yeah, group Twitter, of people. Yes. And that's why I um, I like to see what people think about the articles. Mm -hmm. You can get more um, actual feedback about and people's opinions yes. and interactions. So that's why I sort of enjoy that, that okay. platform probably. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll be sharing this episode on our Twitter and Facebook <laughs> and our podcast platforms. So you can uh, visit our website and all of those different platforms if you want to learn more about Beats Research Radio and our interview today with Dr. Jane Friedman. So thank you very much for joining us here on Beats Research Radio. Thank you very much. And we'll catch all of you next week. Beats Radio, scientists interviewing scientists. Canada is a worldwide leader in science and innovation. However, our communities need to be more connected to current scientific research in order to drive the future of scientific innovation. So what steps can we take to more actively engage and connect our community with scientists and vice versa? Innovation and discovery are at the core of the current efforts of our government, but science sometimes gets slightly complicated to understand. At Beats Radio, we will tackle this by having young scientists and early career researchers interviewing scientists and innovators. By dissecting science in simple terms, this will allow our community to better understand the importance of science for our country.